When your car is broken too, there's only one thing you wanna do. Open your mouth and let it spew. But I am telling you, stay positive. <laughs> When you're baking a cake for your family Your kids are hopped up on caffeine Your fluffy cake is now kinda lean Remember, don't be mean, stay positive That song, you don't think you're gonna be able to handle it? For the, that's a negative thought to have right there. How many people love that song? Like, stay positive, like... Okay, um... Well, be more positive. Anyway, uh... We, we just want to welcome everybody here at our Taylor campus. I want to welcome everybody at our Monroe campus. And I also want to welcome everybody online. Um, you may not know this, but there are more people following us in Australia than in my hometown of Nebraska, or home state of Nebraska. Um, so that shows you how I left Nebraska. Anyway, um, no, no, we've got a lot of viewers online. want to welcome everybody today. We're jumping into this series, Stay Positive. Now listen, this is a series that's really important because everybody out there needs to have this at any point in their life. This is good stuff to hear. But I got to tell you, I need it for me personally. Like I, this is something that like when I came across this concept, this idea, I was like, I, I need that. I need that because I'm a person that deals in in truth and reality, right? And so kind of what that means is if there's a problem between me and you, I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't exist. I'm going to gr aggressively, I may come over to your house and be like, hey, there's a problem between me and you. Let's, let's solve this. Let's fix it. I deal with this. Uh, I deal with issues within myself, within other people, and I do it aggressively. Now, I think that's a really good characteristic, but on the other hand, it also creates kind of a problem that sometimes you focus on everything that's broken and everything that's wrong instead of focusing on what's what? Positive, right? So I need this series. I hope you need it too. We're going to jump into it. Here's what we're going to be looking at. Here's the people that we're going to become over the next several weeks. I've got a list here of what's happening over the next. We're going to talk about how to become grateful, enthusiastic, generous, confident, encouraging. Now, as you look at this list, what you might have a tendency to do is you might have to look at this and go, is this, this kind of looks like child programming. Okay, guys, let's learn how to be enthusiastic today. Right, because you're a little cynical and you're a little jaded, right? Go ahead and nudge somebody that's a little cynical and a little jaded. But what we want to do is that we want to look at this because honestly, isn't this the person you want people to think of you as? You don't want them to be like, man, they're so grounded in reality. They really know what's up. They know everything that's broken with everything, right? They, you don't want to be that. You want to be somebody that people are like, man, they're so grateful. They're enthusiastic. They're generous. They're confident. They're encouraging. And let me go one step farther with this list. Isn't this the kind of people you want to hang around with? Yep. When you think about the people that are a good hang or the people you want in your life, who do you want? You want people who are grateful, enthusiastic, generous, confident, encouraging. Let me put it this way. When you think about all the people on Winnie the Pooh, all the characters on Winnie the Pooh, who do you want to hang out with? I'll tell you the answer to that. There's only one person you don't want to hang out with, and that's Eeyore, right? Well, fell down again, right? That's not, that's not who you want to hang around with. And so we want to become the people, not only that we want people to say about us, but we also want to become the people we want to hang around. And so if you're a little cynical and you're a little jaded, let me just give you a little help. Stop it. Right? We're going to become extremely positive people. So today we're starting with just simply this. I am an optimist. I am an optimist. That's where we're going today. I am an optimist. In fact, it's just good to say out loud. So you may have come in here a pessimist, but we're going to change that, okay? So here's what, say it with me. I am an optimist. I yeah. am an optimist. There you go. Now let's say it with me. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I would be bad at one of those people that, let's say it with me. I am an optimist. There we go. Good job. I'm optimistic that you could do that. So, so optimism, like when, when you think of optimism, you, you might think of people who ignore reality and pretend like everything's okay. Like when you think of optimism, and this is not what we want at all, when you think of optimism, you think of somebody who buries their head in the sand. Somebody that's like, everything's fine. No, everything's fine. Everything's fine. I don't have any money and my relationships are all falling apart, but everything's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, everything's good, right? That's, that's not what we want to teach you at all. In fact, here's what we want. We want you to, to deal with kind of the difficult things in this life, things that are often negative. We want you to deal with those with your hands, but in your heart, we want you to be filled with hope. Can I say that again? 
We, we want you to deal with the things in this life that aren't always fun and sometimes cause a lot of sadness. We want to deal with those things with your hands. You've got to deal with them. But we want your hope, your heart to be filled with hope. When we talk about optimism, that's what we're talking about. And let me say the other thing about optimism is there is plenty in this world to be negative about, to be pessimistic about, isn't there? I mean, I could honestly, if you wanted me to make a list, I could give you more things to be pessimistic about than I could give you things to be optimistic about. I can't. You can be focused. So here's what we've got. We've all got these global things that we can be pessimistic about, right? Right? Oh, this country's falling apart, and there's riots in the streets, and there's shootings in our schools, and the teenage. Oh, don't get me started on the teenagers. And then on top of it all, the government's spraying our crops with poison, right? You can, you can have tons of reason to be negative. And then you've got your own perfect little list, right? This is a perfectly catered to you list of reasons to be negative. I don't, have the, I don't have the job I want, and I don't have the relationships I want, and I don't have the stuff I want, and I don't have the money I want, and I don't live where I want to live, right? You have this perfectly catered things of all these things that you don't want to have, and you can focus, that you can create a huge column of things to be pessimistic about. But all you need, and I'm going to show you this today, all you need is just a few things to really dwell on, to put that hope in your heart. So again, we want you to deal with the negative, sometimes difficult things in this life with your hands, but we want your heart to be filled with hope. Now, the way you get this done is with two words, self-talk, self-talk. Now, some of you might be like, well, that sounds like a psychologist or a counselor, like self-talk. What are you saying? I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful, right? That's what you think of when you think of self-talk. Yes, yes, self-talk's a little bit like this, but here's just the reality. You and I do this. We all talk to ourselves. Sometimes you catch other people talking to themselves, right? You ever do that? And this conversation that you have with yourself is the most important conversation that you ever have. When we first moved to Michigan, uh, we went, went from a small town of about 5,000 in southwest Missouri. We moved to Allen Park, right? It seemed like a very urban area compared to where we were, right? So we moved to Allen Park, and, uh, and we're at a stoplight one day. The weather has finally gotten nice, and we rolled down our windows for the very first time in Michigan. We pulled up to a stoplight. I'm in the car with my kids, and I'm getting ready to think. I'm getting ready to say, mm, isn't it a beautiful day? And all of a sudden, some guy walks by on the sidewalk right next to the truck with our windows down, just expletive after expletive. I'm going to take on the bike in the picture. And I was like, welcome to Michigan, kids. And roll up those windows. Right? So sometimes you catch other people talking to themselves. So in your life, you make decisions based on a conversation that you have with yourself. It's not because you're schizophrenic. It's just the way we all are. We talk to ourselves. And with our words, this is so important to get, with our words, we can build ourselves up, we can pump ourselves up, or we can tear ourselves down. We can pump ourselves up with truth, or we can tear ourselves down with lies. And you have the decision to make in that conversation with yourself of what's going to happen, right? This self-talk is how you make every decision. This self-talk is sets your mood, it sets your tone, and when you talk to other people, you can tell what they've been telling themselves. Come on, you know what I mean? You can tell when you talk to somebody else, man, I can tell what you have been saying to yourself. I can tell what you've been pumping into your life. Because out of that conversation, that dialogue with yourself, comes everything that you are. So this self-talk is important. Now, Psalm 42 describes self-talk. And it describes the self-talk that we need to have. Here's what he says. Why... My soul, are you downcast? Diagram that sentence to me. Who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. He said, why, why my soul? I, I don't think they had mirrors as readily available as we did, but like he's just sitting there going, why are you so down? Why are you so 
downcast. He says, why are you so disturbed within me? Why? What's, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you so down? And then he gives the answer to it all. He says, put your hope in God. That is the key to everything we're going to talk about today. When you are downcast, when you are sad, when you feel far from God, when things aren't going your way, I want you to look into your soul and I want you to say, why are you so down? Put your hope in God. Now let me flesh that out a little. Let me explain. Again, we're not, we're not pretending like everything's fine when everything's not fine. What we're talking about is we're putting our hope in something different. Listen to me. If we're putting our hope in something that the people in this world don't put their hope in. Here's, if, you have to, if you have to hear anything, listen to this next part here. If you, if you have to leave early or you've got irritable bowel syndrome or something and you're going to leave, just, just stick with me for just a second, okay? Listen to this. I am optimistic, not because of what I feel, not because of what I see, but because of what God says. Now let me break that down. I am optimistic, not because of what I feel, right? A lot of times we, we think we're going to wake up in the morning and we're just going to feel it one day. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, I feel pretty good. The chemicals are all balanced and everything's good and it's a sunny day and the birds are chirping and I feel optimistic. But what happens with that? You go to work, you do anything, you talk to somebody that lives in your house, and you're feeling it. <laughs> Right? If you're waiting to just sort of feel it, I can tell you what you're doing. You're, you're hooking your hope to your feelings, and it's going to be a roller coaster. It's going to be a roller coaster for the rest of your life because you're attaching your hope to your current mood, and your current mood changes. And sometimes, you know what? Your current mood is pretty good because you're on a beach. You're like, man, this is great. But sometimes when you're in the 14th week of winter in Michigan, right? Your mood isn't so great, right? Because it is attached to your feelings. And as long as your hope is attached to how you feel, it's going to be a roller coaster ride and you will never be able to have a hope that goes beyond yourself. Uh, I am optimistic not because of what I feel, not because of what I see. This is the other thing we do. We attach our hope to what we see in the world and we keep thinking to ourselves, if, if what's happening in my life will just get better, then I'll be doing great. I, I once uh, had a concrete block in my hand. It was a big old section of concrete, and I was laying it on top of another concrete block in my backyard, and I was scooted it like this, and then I dropped it. Now, my point was I was going to drop it, and I was going to have about this much space between my fingers and the concrete, but I didn't. I miscalculated, and I dropped that whole thing just on the tip of that finger right there, and I smashed it and all the nerve endings, and it just went like that. Smash the end of my finger. Most pain I've ever experienced, right? I pull back. Now, what, was, what did I do? I looked at it, horrified. I was like, oh! But did I keep staring at it? No. That's the last thing you want to do. You want to put that in your hand. You want to cup it like that. You want the blood to pour out, and then you want to look away, right? And as it, over the course of the next month, as it healed, and it just ached every day, the last thing in the world you want to do is just like, look at it, right? I didn't wake up in the morning and be like, okay, I'm going to stare at it until it gets better. That makes it more painful, right? You pick at it a little bit sometimes. You pick the scabs. And be like, oh, there's a piece of, there's a rock in there, you know, right? And you just, you're going to make it worse. You're going to make it worse. Go, That's what we do. We, we put our hope in our current relationships. We put our hope in our current balance in our checking account. We put our hope in the things in this world. We put our hope in, and we look towards, and we look to, and if, if, if everything's going 100% in your life, then everything's good. But that doesn't last. You know that, right? And so you have to put your hope in something that's not your feeling and not what you see. You have to put your hope in something bigger. Anchor your hope, your life, to something bigger. Anchor it to what God says. So I want to want to jump into one thought just real quick. Faith in Christ produces hope. That's like saying water is wet. It's just what it is. If you have put your faith in Christ, you have hope. If you don't have hope, you may have not put your faith in Christ. 
Because faith in Christ produces hope. And if you don't have hope, then you may have not put your faith in Christ. So I want to kind of today, if you have not made that decision to follow Christ, maybe you're sitting out there going, yeah, I haven't really made that decision. I'm interested. What I want you to do is I just want you to sit back for the rest of the time and just sort of observe. And I want you to know what, what the hope would look like if you did. For those of you who have put your faith in Christ, this is required. You have to be filled with hope. You have to anchor your life to the hope that's offered in Christ Jesus because that's what it is. And the last thing the world needs is a bunch of Christians walking around looking like they just had a tablespoon of vinegar. You know what I mean? Like the, God wants us to be people who are filled with hope because of the faith we have. So what I want to do is just out of one chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, I want to give you five reasons. Five reasons, just one chapter, not a whole book. I just want to give you one chapter and five reasons why you can put your hope in Christ. And when you talk to yourself, when you have a conversation with yourself in the shower, in the car, when you go to bed at night, I want you to remember these five things and I want you to tell yourself these. This is where your hope is. So here we go. Romans chapter 8, five things. Number one, my sins are forgiven and my eternity is secure. My sins are forgiven and my eternity is secure. If you've got reason as a follower of Christ to have hope, it's because your guilt, your shame, your sin has been forgiven and your eternity, if you've put your faith in Christ, is secure. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says this, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Really? I should be able to stop there. Really, I should be able to just, every day I should wake up and go, my shame is gone, my sin's forgiven. I've been let off the hook. God canceled my debt. He washed me white as snow. He made me pure and clean, and he's given me forever in eternity with him. Man, it really should only take that one thing. If we anchor our hope to that, not what we, not what we feel, not what we immediately have, not what we see, but if we anchor our hope to that, we will be filled with joy and we might have our hands in the middle of some really ugly stuff, but our hearts will be filled with hope. Number two, my future victory is greater than my present pain. My future victory is greater than my present pain. Pain. Check out what he says, Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. My, our present sufferings, I love how he says it, are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. But sometimes we're kind of we're kind of sad sacks. And I'm talking about the Christians in here. Sometimes, come on, you've been, sometimes you're a sad sack. You're just like, Arr. and God's like, forever, forever in paradise with me, I'm going to reveal my glory in you. There's not going to be any more sin. There's not going to be any more sadness. There's not going to, I'm going to make your life completely new. And that life isn't even worth comparing with the difficulties you have right now. When we first, uh, we had a couple of biological children and I decided I was done because I'm not really big fans of children. I didn't realize that until I had them. Um, and then they got a little older, and we realized, hey, we're pretty all right at this. And they are kind of likable when they grow up a little bit, you know, and it's sort of rewarding. And so we started praying about it, and we made a decision to adopt. And uh, somebody had given us some money and, and uh, kind of a third of the way towards the adoption goal. And so we were like, wow, that's a sign from God. So we started to adopt. Well, the process to do that is a lot more arduous and more expensive than I thought when we first set out on this journey. So we set out to do this, and we had to do all kinds of, all kinds of long classes, right? Um, it's, it's almost, uh, it's one of the more difficult things we've ever had to do over the course of time. And so we even had to drive from Joplin, Missouri to Kansas City to go to a couple of classes. Um, we, had to, we had to round up money and there's always just these hidden costs and there's more that was piling up and it was very difficult and it was stressing uh, my wife Bethany out, you know, it was just sort of a diff and it was just sort of, just kind of difficult. And, we're, and, and at one point we actually had to take everything that we owned 
and we had to put it in a garage sale. Like everything that we had that was just not the shirt off our backs, we, we went all in. We took all of our savings. We, put, we, t- we were all in. And it was just kind of difficult. And on top of that, we had some people turning and saying, should you really you know, be doing this? Maybe, maybe you shouldn't even be doing this, right? And that caused doubt in us. And we're like, I, I, don't, I don't know. And it was just sort of this thing that was difficult. But that all changed one day when we were approved and we were ready to receive profiles. And I think we had to wait maybe a couple of days. And, and then one day we got an email. Now, my wife and I had decided that we were going to adopt the first child that, that they sent us a profile for. We didn't care what the situation was. We were going to do it. That was going to determine that this was the child that was supposed to be in our home. And so we were adopting from Guatemala, and we got this email. I remember watching it. It was on our old Juno email account way back in the day, right? So we had a Juno, and uh, we got this profile, and it said, uh, there's a child named Jose, and he is available for adoption. And then there was a picture, and we clicked on it. And then the picture unfolded, right? Really slowly because the internet was slow and we were waiting for this picture, right, to unfold. And the day everything changed is when that picture finally unfolded and we saw this. And we were just like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Paperwork? Who cares? Having to travel? Who cares? Expense? Who cares? None of, none of it mattered anymore. The, the difficult that we had was incomparable. It didn't matter at all compared to what we were going to receive in Jose. So we flew to Guatemala, and they actually brought him to our hotel room, and we met Jose for the first time, and we got to hang out with him. And then we, we put him, and he was just a baby, and we put him back in the orphanage. And then we had to do one of the hardest things we've ever do. We had to put him back in the orphanage. We had to fly back, and we had to wait three months and then fly back again. And we didn't even think about it. We, we were filled with hope. And we were able to fly back a few months later. And then in the Guatemala embassy, we were able to adopt Jose. And we changed his name to Josiah Jose Luis Agler. And he became our child. Yeah, yeah, because that's... And, and looking back... We don't ever remember any difficulty. It's just like, well, it's insignificant. All we remember is the beautiful process that went through that. Now he's an obnoxious teenager, but anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> just kidding. It's amazing. I want you to tell, tell you guys this. I know life seems difficult, and we stare at that pain, and there's, the, oh, there's this, and there's that, and this is so difficult, and this is so hard, but what God is telling you is, listen, it's incomparable. It doesn't matter. It's insignificant. It means nothing compared to your future glory that is in Christ Jesus. Number three from Romans 8 goes like this. God, God is for me. God is for me. Not only does he have hope for you in the future, but he's for you right now. It says this, uh, Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? When I was a seventh grader, I used to get picked on because I was a big kid. I was about the size I am now, minus 60 or 70 pounds, you know, but... Uh, I was was a big kid, and so I would have high schoolers, like, like, pick a fight with me. And one day I was hanging out with my brother and this other guy that played on the football team. They were both big linemen, older than me. And uh, they took off around the school. And all of a sudden I was standing face to face with this senior. And he wanted to pick a fight with me. He starts pushing me. He starts calling me names. I'm a seventh grader. And it's not like I was raised in Detroit. Okay. I'm just like, oh, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm like, and so I was just, I'm acting tough, you know, on the outside. But inside I'm like, I'm going to die. He's going to kill me. And so I was like, like really scared that how this was going to go down. He didn't know I was only in seventh grade. He thought he was picking on a senior. So anyway, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I heard my brother's obnoxious voice. It was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> my brother and his friend come around there, <laughs> and they come up and they're like, hey, and they just walk up on us and they're like, hey, what's going on? And I looked over at him and then I looked back and this guy was <laughs> gone, right? He was out of there. He had no interest in it. If that's how much hope I'm filled with because my brother is for me, who, you know, kind of likes me, if my brother is for me, you need to get your mind around this. God's on your side. He's working for 
you and nobody can stand against him. He goes on in Romans 8. Next verse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Next verse, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Say it with me. No one. No No one one condemns. There is no one that can stand opposed. There is no evil that can come against us. No one can be opposed for us because God is for you. And not only is God for you, but number four, God is working everything for my good. God is working everything for my good. It doesn't always feel like that. But I want to promise you that God is working for your good. He's putting all the pieces together. Now again, it doesn't always feel like that. uh, There's a song we sing uh, here at church. I, I, I love the song now, but when we first started singing it, I didn't like it. It's a song that goes, you know, you are good, and that's true, you are good, you are good, but then there's this one sign that's like, you're never going to let, never going to let me down. That's how it sounded in my head anyway, so (laughs) you're like, that's why they sing, and you do not. Um, You're never going to let me down, you're never going to let me down, you're never going to let me down. When I first heard that, I was like, I don't know if I agree with that. God, like, seems to let people down in the Bible a lot, right? Right? Like one, of the, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is, is David. David had promised that he was going to be king. And then he spent the last, next 15 years running from his enemies. He did not see the throne. He wasn't the king. For 15 years, he never saw God's promise fulfilled. In fact, there's this one part where he's running from his enemies. Not only did he not feel like a king, but he was running from his enemies to the point where this was his only resort. He had to act like he was crazy so his enemies wouldn't kill him. It's a, great, it's a great verse in 2 Samuel. You, you see King David, the promised king of Israel, get down on his hands and knees and act like a crazy person. He let, he let saliva run down his beard and he scratched at the doorpost so everybody would think he was crazy and leave him alone. Right? Do you think at that point he was like, he's never going to let, never going to let me down. Right? And so I I hear that, and I'm like, "Ah, yeah, I don't know. I think God lets us down. And then I was thinking, like, Abraham, God promised Abraham, Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And then he goes home, and his wife is barren. And she remains barren for 25 years. And those of you who know what that's like, that is so painful to watch and endure, and they have to deal with, well, what does this mean? God promised me I'm going to be a father of a great nation. And... My wife's barren. So I was listening to that song. Um, He's never going to let me down. I don't know. Yeah, he, he might let you down. But I came full circle because it occurred to me, wait a minute. God fulfilled every promise he ever gave. David became king. It may not have been in the time frame that he thought, but David became king. In fact, David became the most renowned king in the Old Testament. He gets to be the participant of stories of people that don't even aren't even interested in, in God refer to David. They refer to David and Goliath like he became the king. Abraham, there's a little song we sing. I don't know if you've heard it. Father Abraham, and many sons, right? 3,000 years later in VBS, right? We're singing about Father Abraham because God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. It may not always feel like God is for you, but he is for you. In fact, he is working everything in creation to your advantage. Romans 8.28 says this, and we know that in all things, you know what the Greek word is for all? It means all. Like everything, yeah. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He doesn't work it good for everybody. He works everything on the planet for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Not only is God for you, but God is working everything in the universe around you. Number five, nothing can separate me from the love of God. 
If you feel separated from the love of your parents, if you feel separated from the love of your child, if you feel separated from the love of the people in this world that you love the most, just know that God will always be there. And you may not always feel his love, but nothing can separate you from his love. Romans 8 ends this way. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You, as a follower of Christ, if that's you, have reason to have hope because God loves you. God is working all things together for you. God is for you. He is not against you. And he has saved you. He has forgiven your sins and given you a future hope. Here's what I want you to do with this information. This week, today, anytime you're downcast in your soul, anytime you're down, don't anchor it to your situation. Don't anchor your hope to your feelings. Don't anchor your hope to anything other than what God says, if you will do that over and over and over again, you will see yourself be very optimistic, be a person filled with hope. Let me pray for you. God, I pray that we would have hope today. I pray that every person who is here today, everybody watching online, everybody that's paying attention, God, I pray that we would be filled with hope, that we would be optimistic. God, that we would have joy in our hearts, not based on our feelings, not based on our circumstances, but based on who you are and what you've promised us. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.